So until now, we have learned about both the storage infrastructure and the programming model of MapReduce. Next, we will go under the hood of the MapReduce system to understand how it actually works in a distributed setting. As a recap, let's look at this figure. Usually a MapReduce task is split into three steps. The first step, of course, is the map function, which will read the input and produces a set of key value pairs. For example, it will read this trunk of bit documents and it will produce a set of intermediate key value pairs here, K1B, K2B, et cetera, et cetera. And the second step will be the group by key step which collects all the pairs with the same key and put them together as you can see in here. And the last step, the reduce step also will be performed in a reduced node. It will collect all the values belonging to the key and output a final pair. And this is how it looks like when you want to do things in parallel. And one map step can be split into several several map tasks. For example, here we split it into three map tasks. And similarly, the reduced step is split into two reduced paths. And if you look at one of these map tasks, again, the map function will map one trunk of the file into some intermediate key value pairs. And then we have a partition function. What, what is this partitioning function doing? What it does is that it tries to split all these, or we can say distribute all these intermediate key value pairs into multiple reduced pairs. And you can think of it as a hash function to hash the key of each pair into some reduced test so that the key value pairs with the same key always ends up in the same reduced task. And if you look more closely in a reduced task, after the reduced task collects the result from the map task, it will first sort and group all these, all these key value pairs. And all these key value pairs with the same key become a key and a list of values. And then you will perform the reduce function to reduce this group key value pair into a final key value pair. As so you can see that all the phases are actually distributed with many tasks doing the work. And in the map reduce framework, users only need to define the input, the output, um, the map function and the reduce function. And the map reduce environment will automatically take care of the partitioning of the input data, scheduling the program's execution across a set of machines. And these two are usually done by the master node. And it also performs a group by key step this is the step between the map function and the step function. And also machines fail, right, sometimes. So it has to handle the machine failures and also manage required inter-machine communication. In terms of data flow, the input and final output are actually stored on a distributed file system. So these are storage that are persistent and the scheduler will try to schedule the map task close to the physical storage location of the input data. Recall that we usually have multiple copies of file chunks, right? But obviously we don't need multiple copies of map tasks because that way we will have a lot of wasted computation. So, and in the immediate results are actually stored on a local file system of map and reduce workers. Why is this? Is this mainly just to avoid expensive web traffic because it things some things are better done in a local file system. For example, in in the partitioning function or when you're producing the intermediate key value pairs from the map function. And finally, the output 
is offered the input to another MapReduce task. And besides, besides the data flow, another problem is coordination. And the master node takes care of the coordination. And you can think of it as you have a lot of tasks. Some are map tasks and some are reduced tasks. And each task can be one of the three statuses. It can be idle, which means that the task hasn't been started. And it can also be in progress or completed. An idle task got scheduled when there were new workers become available. And when a map task completes, it will send the master the location and sizes of its R intermediate files. Why, we, why do we need R intermediate files? This is because it has to distribute its results to R reducers, right? So it has to have R intermediate files. And the master will push this kind of information to corresponding reducers. And also it will ping the workers periodically to detect failures. And speaking of failures, different kinds of workers actually have different ways of dealing with them. For example, if one map worker fails, the map tasks that are completed or in progress at the worker are often reset to idle. Why is this? This is because the intermediate files inside these nodes are no longer accessible. So you have no choice but to reset this task into idle and wait until some new workers become available and then you can restart these map tasks on these workers. And of course the reduced worker that are corresponding to this map task will also be notified when the tasks are rescheduled. And when a map um, this is when a map this is this is what a map worker does when it fails. And when the reduced worker fails, only in progress tasks are reset to idle. Why? This is because the reducer's outputs are actually stored in a global distributed file system. These are the final outputs, right? So final outputs are, all, are always inside the distributed file system. And these are persistent storage. So you don't need to worry about losing them. And similarly, the reduced task is restarted when there were new workers available. And finally, if a master node fails, this is the worst thing because then the map reduced task has to be aborted and the client is notified. Unless you have a redundant master node to avoid this kind of single point failure. And besides building with a failure, Another problem is that how many map and reduced jobs you have to reschedule. How do you choose M and R? The rule of thumb is to make the M equal or even larger than the number of nodes in the cluster. And one distributed file system chunk per map is actually a very common choice. And this is to improve the dynamic load balancing and speeds up recovery from worker failures. And more concretely, let's say that you only allow one map task per node. And if some map workers fails and have to reschedule this map task into some new node, and then it has no choice but to wait until some node finishes the job. But if you allow one node to take multiple map tasks, then it doesn't have to wait, right? and the load balancing is much better in this way. And second, usually the R, which is the number of reduced tasks is smaller than the number of map tasks. One reason is that the output is a summarization of the map tasks, right? So the map tasks, you have N map tasks, naturally the R needs to be smaller than N. And the second reason, is that the final output is actually spread across R files in the distributed system. So you would want these R files to be in the smaller number of files so that it's like it will be more it will be more easily accessed by later MapReduce tasks. 